19th, 2020. And um, I, just by way of preamble, to remind people that due to um, Governor Baker's March 12, 2020 executive order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, um, uh, public bodies are able to carry out their responsibilities while adhering to public health recommendations regarding social distancing um, by conducting uh, public meetings remotely, and in this case, over Zoom. Uh, the public still has access uh, via Zoom or um, and of course uh, watching meetings and information on how to access meetings uh, is uh, provided in the um, the meeting notices. Also, I would just like to uh, announce who's with us today. So I'm Melinda Collins. I'm the chair of the select board, and Katie Conlon is vice chair. Arthur Doyle, secretary. Uh, Michael Zulis is a member, and um, Richard Wells is um, not able to join us this evening. He's uh, teaching a course, but uh, he'll be with us uh, tomorrow for our meeting. So um, our town administrator, Michael Dennehy, uh, is with us, as is Hillary Waite, who is the executive administrative assistant to the board, and um, uh, our meeting host from MATV. Also, our um, MCAC rep, Tom Stority. So, uh, welcome and thank you. Also, just to remind people, I think most people are aware that the meetings are recorded. Uh, it's a long standing practice, and uh, we'll be taking votes by roll call. Um, and uh, just if people are not, can't hear, or um, members uh, um, aren't audible, you know, please uh, speak up. Um, very good. So I would like to call the meeting to order at uh, 7.05. And if people would join us in saying the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you. I pledge allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. To the Republic. For which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. Um, very much appreciated. So, um, the, before the um, the board moves on with um, uh, its discussion uh, of, uh, of the draft letter. We'll have public comment and then we'll move on. So anyone who wishes to make a statement, um, if you're on Zoom on your computer, you can use your mouse to, or the trackpad to go down to the, the bottom center of your screen and um, click uh, raise hand, and then um, you'll be recognized. And at that point, uh, you'll be able to um, unmute yourself. Um, and uh, for those who are on the phone, you would press star nine to raise your hand, and then um, press star six when you're recognized to, to unmute yourself and then mute yourself again. And just for a reminder for all of us, um, that you know, we support the civility in the space and um, we'll refrain from interrupting each other uh, while we're speaking. Okay. So, just bring the participants back up. And uh, the first person is Robert Gunderson. If you could please give us your address and um, your statement, please. Everyone will have three minutes. Madam Chair, uh, the user is using an older version of Zoom that requires me to promote them for them to be able to speak. Is that okay with you? Oh, okay. And uh, and I, I will I'll keep time and remind people when their three minutes is up. I can't see. 
Let's see. Mr. Anderson, you've been promoted to panelist, so you should now have permission to go on video and unmute. Excellent, thank you. Hello, could you please um, state your address and then give us your statement? Hello? Hello, Robert Gunderson? Hello? Um, Hillary, can you hear me speaking to you? I can. It appears the speaker has left the camera view. Um, so uh, no. This is Judith Gunderson. Uh, I'm using Robert Gunderson's computer because mine is not functioning today. Oh, okay. Hello. Hi. So may we have your, your address and your statement, please? Sure. 32 Woodchester Drive, Milton, Mass. Thank you. Uh, my statement is that I'm, I'm uh, commenting about the EA draft. I have 57 pages and I see no mention of the ANEC Milton Advisory Committee um, airplanes and I don't understand why they were not included. Um, in addition, there are a lot of mistakes, statements made here that have been refuted in the past but are still being stated. Examples are landing gear, and DNL, they're simply not right information. Third, um, expecting Quincy and Braintree to accept part of our burden will not fly. I'm sorry, pun and unintended. We need to ask that 4R and 4L share the volume. Logan is not moving, it's not going any place. The airplanes are not going any place. They're going to come back to the pre-COVID numbers which range anywhere from the high 100s to over 500 a day. But right now, or before COVID, 4R gets nine times the amount of traffic as 4L, and failure to relocate some of that traffic is really uh, a doom for the resale value of Milton Homes here. <clears throat> Finally, I think you need to understand that the FAA is a technical agency. When your information is technically wrong, they will stop reading what you have written and ignore you. You can spend a hundred pages on legalistic and documentary elocutionary drama, but you will have lost them at the get-go. That's the end of my statement. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next person is Cindy Christensen. Madam, Madam Chair? Yeah. Um, Madam Chair, if, 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 I, if I may, just, just uh, before Dr. Christensen offers comment, if I could just um, point out, we, we have received Dr. Christensen's written comments and on the subject matter of tonight's meeting and those written con comments contain the same type of personal attacks and invective that have become all too common in some of her submissions. Now, the members of the board have signed up for that. If Dr. Christensen wants to say things about us, so be it. But our hardworking volunteers did not sign up for that. And this board cannot sit idly by while Dr. Christensen continues personal attacks and invective directed at our appointee, Mr. Doherty. It is not courteous, it is not civil, and it is not appropriate, particularly for this board's public comment. So my suggestion and proposal is that if Dr. Christensen engages in those types of personal attacks and invective directed at Mr. Doherty again tonight, that we move on to the next speaker. Uh, 
Um, I hear what you have to say, Mr. Zulis, and um, it is public comment and people are um, able under the First Amendment and um, Article 16 to, to say uh, what they will until it's proven that it's defamatory. So, um, you know, everybody gets their three minutes. That's important. And, um, and but I, 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 I do hear what you're saying. Okay, um, Dr. Christensen, would you please give us your address and your statement? This is Cindy Christensen, 59 Columnworth Street, Milton. I'm a town meeting member for Precinct 7. And before my three minutes begins, I would like to comment on what Mr. Zulis said. After the way this board, everyone except on this board, except for um, Arthur Doyle treated me, when I was a town volunteer. I think what you just said, Mr. Zulis is highly hypocritical and um, disrespectful. We'll begin with my statement. <clears throat> Clearly, a lot of work has gone into the draft comment letter. However, relying on legalese without your arguments being secured to a strong foundation of technical knowledge, the select board will not slay the FAA Goliath with this letter, and you'll miss an opportunity that could be helpful to those you represent. The FAA is a technical agency. Your letter is not technically correct in many ways. There are fatal flaws and other significant problems in the arguments presented. These were preventable. Several Milton residents with more knowledge than you offered to be part of the Citizens Committee. This board asked the town administrator to organize back in January. That didn't happen. To my knowledge, you did not consult with your airplane noise advisory committee members, but instead have relied upon one Milton resident your MCAC representative to provide expertise in technical areas where he clearly is not an expert. I wrote to you with my comments over the weekend. I will not repeat them here, but I want the public to know that I have tried again to help the residents of Milton by trying to share my knowledge and expertise, both of which have not been welcomed by this board. In 2012 legislation, Congress mandated the implementation of RNAVs at major airports. The FAA will not let what Milton wants trump federal law, especially when they can show safety and efficiency improvement, less environmental noise, and no significant impact. So what should the town's response to the draft, draft EA include? Number one, I've said this before, a request for runway use restrictions on 4R and 4L. Number two, an increased offset of 15 degrees for the 4L path with no straight in 4L. And you also should ask for close to equal split between the approaches to 4R and 4L. These suggestions would be helpful to those in the sandwich between 4R and 4L paths and also to East Milton residents while not giving more than their share to Milton residents west of the 4R path. In 2019, there were nine jet approaches to 4R for every one approach to 4L. That isn't fair to those under the 4R path, an area that this board also is supposed to represent. Advocating for a near split would show that Milton is willing to disperse planes over its own town as a model for how flight path dispersion decisions should be made across town boundaries. Expecting other communities to our east to increase their noise burden but not expecting the same in the quieter areas in Milton is hypocritical and detrimental to the cause. And if you're going to try to say, but the MIST study will disperse the um, over those four R's, no one should believe that. Both Quincy and Braintree have opposed Milton's proposals. And my guess is that Weymouth, Kingham and others are not far behind. You also are missing an opportunity because you should be encouraging the FAA to increase the uncharted left transition use of the soon to be implemented for LRNAV. The FAA has a good efficiency argument for using more of that transition, which could substantially reduce the approaches to 4R. That should be part of your lengthy, lengthy comment. Thank you. I don't see one more person, but I don't see other hands raised. If anyone else wishes to speak? Yeah, okay. Thank you. 
So we all, we all move on to the board portion. So first, um, I would like to, to, um, to say that uh, the board is very appreciative of all the appointees. And um, I, I would really personally like to thank um, uh, Mr. Doherty for his work, um, not just on this, but uh, since he's, he's joined us. Um, and uh, Mr. Zulf and Ms. Conlon for their work on the letter, as well as um, at the ANAC chair, the Airplane Noise Advisory Committee, for those of you who are, are kind of new to this uh, here, and the Airplane Noise Advisory Committee for their um, participation um, with, uh, with with comments and, and drafting, and um, Karis North, who's our council who specializes in um, Airplane and environmental issues. So I'm 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 really appreciative and um, of all this work. And we've received um, some some letters uh, uh, that uh, that also um, I'm very appreciative for um, good good points and uh, and constructive comments and um, also support. So uh, good good to good to um, have all of those as well. Uh, I would like to, at the moment, uh, pass it on to uh, Mr. Zulip. He and Ms. Conlon uh, have been uh, busy with our um, state, and actually Mr. Dennehy too, with our state and federal uh, legislators. Um, and, uh, and he'll give us a little overview and, and some background before uh, he turns it over to Mr. Jordan. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, the FAA has proposed to use the runway 4L flight path, which takes planes directly over Dorchester, Mattapan, and part of Milton, as an unfettered RNM, which would effectively create another superhighway in the sky with plane after plane after plane going over the same neighborhoods. I was part of the adoption of the 4L RNM path. The FAA is purported to engage in an environmental assessment process and has produced a draft environmental assessment, which with the appendices numbers in hundreds of pages. Uh, comments on the draft environmental assessment are due this Friday, November 20th. Now the draft comments that are before this board tonight, which number in about, number about 57 pages, and then there's an appendix to go along with it. Um, this was the result, as you pointed out, Madam Chair, of the combined efforts of Katie Conlon, Andy Schmidt of the uh, Airplane Noise Advisory Committee, who also published the draft to the other ANAC members, as I understand, Karis North from our town council's office, Tom, Tom Doherty, as you mentioned, our Massport CAC representative, myself, and residents who have submitted comments. Uh, the comments reflect the overall views that the procedure and methodology for the environmental assessment have been fundamentally flawed and that the draft environmental assessment and the related workshops have included material misstatements and omissions from the FAA. These reasons, the comments state that the environmental assessment process should be canceled and rescinded and that the draft environmental assessment should be withdrawn. Now we have sought and we are seeking uh, support of elected officials at the federal, state, and local, le uh, local level for these comments. Thus far, Senator Timothy, Representative Driscoll, uh, Boston City Councilor Andrea Campbell of District 4, which covers parts of Dor uh, Dorchester and Mattapan, have signed on to these comments. And we hope and expect to have more signatories before we submit them this week. And, and so, um, to give an overview, as you mentioned, Madam Chair, of um, the uh, the highlights of the comments, I'll now ask Mr. Doherty uh, to go through that, uh, to go through that, and um, and uh, I think we're going to have um, uh, Hillary uh, share the uh, the uh, the document itself, or at least the beginning of it. Thank you, uh, Mr. Zulis, and uh, Madam Chair, and. Select board. 
And um, Ms. Way, if you could take and turn to the fourth page of this, uh, four out of 57, that'll, thank you. I'll, I'll use, obviously I uh, will try to give an overview and some highlights and not to try to burden uh, anyone with, uh, uh, too, or overburden anyone with too much uh, uh, detail. But what I'll do then is to um, begin with the fact that the FAA states that it uh, needs the uh, RNAV path for uh, two reasons. And first of all, the, the 4L path is and has been a visual path only. So the first uh, statement that the FAA uh, makes is that they have a safety need. And the second is that they have an efficiency need for uh, converting that into a, uh, the availability of a, an RNAV path uh, for certain purposes. That, and I'll go through that, safety need and efficiency need. But this started, as you can see on this page, and I'm not gonna go through in every detail, in 2015-16, where uh, there was an so-called initial environmental report and initially a determination by the FAA that adding a hyper-concentrated RNAV path to the uh, extant uh, uh, 4L path approach uh, would have no significant environmental impact, noise or pollution, et cetera. And that was their initial uh, view. And that uh, in response to that, there was significant community involvement some of you will remember the May 2015 meeting. You'll remember uh, Congressman Lynch, Senator Timothy, uh, Representative Driscoll, Cullinane, the select board, and uh, scores of residents uh, saying, wait a minute, uh, we, we challenge this essentially. That's reviewed and summarized uh, at the beginning there, 2015-16. And at that point, the FAA committed uh, that it would conduct an environmental assessment uh, and uh, then for years did nothing. During 2016 and 2017 and 2018 into 2019, of course, planes were flying, unlike now, but, but they saw no reason in, for either a safety uh, need or an efficiency need to proceed. Then we get to 2020 and actually in late 2019, December, they said, we're gonna go ahead with an environmental assessment. And at that point, of course, planes were flying. Uh, they said they would use a uh, baseline year for comparative purposes of uh, October, 2018 to November, 2000, November 1, 2019. And they would be uh, then uh, proceeding apace. At that point, uh, one of the things I did was ask them to define with regard to 4L, runway 4L arrivals, uh, what the status was as to uh, the, the types of uh, approach uh, methodologies that would, are being used. That is to say, it's a, it's a visual path only. The RNAP was proposed to be a, a, a so-called poor weather path, an inclement uh, meteorological uh, conditions path. And there was in 2000, as we know, 14, 15 uh, timeframe, the JetBlue path, which is to the, so the west side of, Man of uh, Milton over Mattapan, over Dorchester. So I asked, look, you're gonna need to be clear about what the, um, is gonna happen with respect to that JetBlue path. They came back and said, it's been discontinued, uh, but we'll see uh, as we go forward what the remaining questions are as to that. So that was in January, and I thought then at, the, at that point that it was going to proceed as planes were flying. But then the pandemic hit, and uh, we, uh, the the, the uh, MCAC, at my request, uh, asked that the environmental assessment be deferred, given the fact that uh, there are people in Milton, Mattapan, Dorchester, who all of whom obviously affected by the uh, COVID-19. Many of them are essential workers, some at hospitals, uh, everyone has you know, home care and other uh, concerns. And the response was no, uh, we're gonna go forward even though in response to my letter in, and, and the MCAC's letter in May, uh, planes, will, planes, planes will, 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 the utilization will pick up uh, and so we're gonna go forward. But of course that wasn't the case. There were fewer, there were 
five planes in, in, in May, I think. In June, I think there might have been seven. In August, back to five. Nine, and nine in September, as I recall, uh, on 4L. It, it just was uh, inappropriate. Three times there were requests, and those requests were joined in by the select board, by Congressman Lynch, by Senator Timothy, by uh, Representative Driscoll, uh, to defer every single time. Uh, no was the answer. With regard to safety, uh, in one of those uh, uh, requests, I specifically included the statement, you've not uh, particularized your safety rationale for proceeding. So we're gonna come to that in a second. Then on uh, November uh, 15th, they proceeded. Uh, it's, a, it's a footnote, but what we said is if you are going to proceed, which you should not, you, you can't do what you did in your other recent uh, uh, environmental assessments down in Florida, which is to have a 30 day comment period and release the draft midway through the comment period. You should have a longer comment period and release it at the beginning. And they did uh, do that. That was the only thing they actually did responsive to what we were requesting. So that began and there was a meeting uh, promptly with the elected officials and the FAA, including uh, Congressman Lynch. Um, and at that meeting, the uh, the regional director, uh, regional administrator of the FAA stated that the elected officials uh, could submit technical questions that would be answered at the uh, so-called workshops and uh, they should be submitted uh, and we're free to do that. Uh, the Congressman Lynch, Senator Timothy, uh, Representative Driscoll, the select board submitted technical questions uh, promptly and uh, then uh, we're told that they, there would not be uh, responses to them provided at the workshop. And to this, and to this day, there have not been response, uh, responses to those, except for one minor thing. But on the particular important questions which are laid out in this draft, no response. Now, uh, then we go forward and I wanna talk about the, um, the three important aspects of the, uh, of, the, of the draft, that is to say, the scope of this environmental assessment, uh, its methodology, and its non-transparency. As it says there in this uh, summary, the scope fails to differentiate its general study area from an approach study area. Let me stop there. What this uh, draft this environmental assessment does is it takes for a, a, a general study area and, and no other area, that's the only area it uses. And it looks across 1,173 square miles of area and all 427,000 Logan flight uh, operations as it, as it might affect over 1 million people. Now, for purposes of overall air traffic compatibility, to make sure that this added approach is compatible with all the other arrivals and departures, that makes sense. But for purposes of understanding what the noise effect on the people subject to these, uh, appro this approach procedure, the 4L RNAV, it's, it's completely arbitrary, capricious, and makes no sense. Uh, the, study area that they're using includes, you know, locations such as Wellesley and Hopkinton and uh, Medford and uh, Sherburne and Ashland. In other words, many places uh, who are not within the, the approach path of these, uh, of, of, of these, this runway and it's a, a comparable runway, the uh, for our runway, the CSPR. And by CSPR, it means it's a closely spaced parallel runway. What's that approach path? The, the FAA itself acknowledges that if you look just uh, south of the Blue Hills, say on the run, like the Route 93 area, they have the 4L and the 4R in, uh, initial fixes, the, those waypoints. And they, on the 4L, the planes will approach down to the 4L runway and 4R approach down to the 4R. At the runway point, those two runway center points are 1,500 feet apart, 1,500 feet apart. At the Blue Hills area where the approach path uh, initiates, they're only 4,500 feet apart. 
and they reduce by approximately 200 feet in, in width per mile. So that the square mile area that we're talking about and that the, for approach and the population underneath that uh, is, is no, no, nothing like what they're looking at with respect to the uh, widespread area they're looking at for air traffic uh, purposes. And yet they're using it for noise uh, impact purposes where the square mile area is something like 23 square miles in the population, a fraction of the million that, uh, that in the other total area. That has big impacts, uh, that scope, uh, uh, a defect, arbitrary defect, failure to differentiate and to use two uh, modalities for the air traffic compatibility, that general scope, and what I would call an approach scope, uh, approach scope uh, area that looks at that uh, approach path corridor and the noise co contours both within it as they overlap, uh, 4L and 4R noise that people understand and experience is shared uh, and they experience effects of both, but also the contours for 4L to the west and 4R to the east. And the um, comments here point out, A, that this environmental assessment doesn't take the contours into account even though the FAA has statements as, and it's in the draft uh, comments as to when and how they will take those uh, contours into account. They don't do that. And the FAA then, in addition to not taking into account the contours, uh, it fails analytically then in terms of its uh, noise measurements, and we'll come to that. Uh, similarly, within those contours are so-called noise sensitive areas, those include residents, but they also include libraries, uh, schools, churches, uh, hospitals. And as you know, right in just uh, Ridgedale Road area, you've got St. Elizabeth's, you've got uh, Beth Israel. Beyond that, you've got the, the library, but you've also down from there, you've got uh, uh, Milton Academy. That triangle alone uh, is one requiring some special attention. They don't do that at all. So. Um, they fail to differentiate the study area purposes uh, from, from air traffic compatibility and noise impact, uh, and they ignore those CSPR realities. They're also supposed to look at cumul cumulative impacts under the, the, uh, the National Environment, Environmental Protection Act, and they, again, they don't uh, do that either for the, for the reasons that are analogous. And Hillary, if you can scroll down a, a little bit for the rest of this page, I'll go to the next uh, part, which is uh, methodology. Can Hillary do that? Just wait a second. I'm not seeing what I'd like to do is to keep going. Let me let me keep okay, yeah, fine. Yeah. No, well, uh, no back 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 to uh, yeah, you'll see the word yeah, set five methodology. Let's use let's let's keep going there. So methodology. Uh, what they're doing is they they are not um, defining the permitted use. We'll start there. So what they say is we need this for safety reasons and efficiency reasons because 4L path is a visual path. It's not uh, a path that can be used in bad weather. And so for, for safety reasons, we need it in bad in, to use it in bad weather. And uh, for efficiency reasons, we need to because in the bad weather, there are delays on 4R, which has an RNAV path uh, procedure that uh, it itself uh, is, is not able to then shift planes in, in, as bad weather occurs onto and over onto uh, 4L to pick up and reduce those delays. And so for an efficiency reason, they need it as well. So uh, first of all, they then say the number of planes that they may uh, want to and, and will uh, as they measure it shift 
are 255 planes a year, 255 planes a year. But they say that that is going to occur without saying that that's the limit, that's, that, that the permitted use will only be on the inclement days as they've me measured them, which are called eligible in inclement days. And the, the 255 planes derives from their measurement definition of eligible. Their eligible uh, definition is uh, six uh, uh, consecutive hours of uh, bad weather or eight out of 10. And they say there are seven days of those a year. And so that will be 255 additional planes that would be shifted over onto 4L. Now, I question that and I'll come to that in a minute, but is that the limit? They nowhere say, and they've been asked repeatedly by the elected officials and others, is that the limit? Are you saying that you will only use this in uh, IMC conditions, bad weather conditions, and that you expect and can show that that's the degree of delay, 255 flights? Nowhere do they say no, we will not use it in any other conditions. And now the, the eligible flights that they say, these seven per, 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 per year, are inconsistent and incompatible with our actual experience. There are 130 days a year of recorded uh, rain uh, conditions. And if they're looking at the delay issue, why don't they look at the Department of Transportation Bureau of Statistics delay statistic for 2019, which uh, shows that there are not uh, seven uh, days of delay, uh, but, 5% of the flights total are delayed and 5% of the flights on 4R, 4L, sorry, uh, would be 30, would be 3,600, not 255. Because although Logan reports the jets that arrive on 4L and they say that that's around, you know, uh, say 5,800, 6,000 a year, there are another 6,000 of uh, propeller uh, planes that arrive. And so there's no uh, clarity whatsoever on the, what limit there is to the permitted use. And there's, I think, no uh, fair fundamental basis for the assumption that there are only seven eligible days in, in relation to the actual uh, delays that we're experiencing. And they don't use the, the actual delays to begin with. Um, so they don't also, as, the, as these technical questions that the elected officials asked, provide a table, which even in the environmental, uh, initial environmental report that they did, they had a table and it said, here's in, in, in visual conditions, how many planes we expect to be used first year, second year, whatever. Here's in, uh, in, in, in inclement meteorological conditions. Uh, here's how many uh, planes we expect to be uh, used and whether they're cleared use or so-called advisory use. And I'll stop and insert this here. Remember I mentioned JetBlue and I mentioned asking the question, what use is there going to be of the 4L path on any basis? Remember they want to have a 4L RNAV and they're saying it's only 255 planes and I challenge that. But secondly, what about the use on an advisory basis uh, where, as they said in response to the question, well, if a airline has in its flight management system a, a path that it is itself used and, can, and it wants to create and use that glide slope and that path, uh, that would be permissible. At, and, and if that's the case, then either JetBlue or other airlines could use on a visual day, on an on a, uh, inclement day, they could use a narrow path in addition to this uh, for our RNAV path, or they could use the RNAV path itself. That set of requests for, for a table for clarity was not answered and still not answered. All right, I'll speed up a little bit, but on the uh, efficiency assumption, if you read it, I think you'd get, a, you'd get a kick out of this. So it turns out that the efficiency assumption, when I asked them, put up, us in, into, the, into the picture, tell us, what is the basis for your efficiency uh, claim and what's the basis for your, your safety claim? On the safety claim, just to take a second, they said, finally in the draft EA, well, 
since, since 2016, we have three instances, one in 2016 and, 2000, and two in 2019, of three small propeller planes. Uh, two of those were de Havilland's, one was a Cessna. And uh, in each case, the, the plane was coming in from the west toward uh, a, a runway 15R and then circled down instead to, to in visual conditions to, to uh, land on 15, I'm sorry, on, on 4L. Okay, so coming in on 15R, but then circled down to from the west and then circled down to come in instead on 4 that was that was permitted. Uh, it happened, but in each instance, these are propeller planes that had no GPS uh, identified as on board, and so it's not ones that would be using an, a, an RNAV path anyway. It was in visual conditions, not in uh, uh, <laughs> bad weather IMC conditions, which is what the RNAV is, is designed for and said to be going to be used for, uh, and uh, in, in each one of these. Uh, they were in visual contact with the uh, air, airport. One of them uh, was uh, uh, flying too fast, and so it had to circle around. So that's no basis to proceed and try to burden people with an RNAV when, in fact, uh, for IMC conditions, bad weather conditions, when, in fact, they only have examples of three uh, planes in, uh, in, in clear conditions. And lastly, the, this even though they wouldn't have to have an RNAV in order to address all that, in the Appendix D to the draft, which you have to get through by going through hundreds of or scores of pages to get to, they actually say that actually uh, they don't intend to uh, continue the use of that coming into 15 and then turn R and then turning down approach anyway. So there is no safety need demonstrated. And there's no clarity, I'll come to the, the lack of clarity in the disclosures here, but there's no clarity in this document that allows people to understand that by, by reading it in a succinct way. And so I don't think that need is um, substantiated, nor do I think is it, is it communicated uh, in, in a materially complete way. On the efficiency need, they said it would reduce the delay in the bad weather. And I've mentioned the fact that the delays uh, are not even uh, part of their measurement. And so I won't go uh, back to that, um, but they don't limit it, as I've said, to, uh, to delays uh, in terms of its use. All right, so then next, let's talk about, and I'll, I'll try to speed up a bit, but let's talk about this, the use of their, me their metric, the so-called DNL metric. DNL is a yearly average noise metric for day and night uh, decibel level on a yearly average basis. So if you think about it, uh, the uh, planes on runways 4L and 4R are operating 34% of the year. Logan publishes that statistic religiously. It's, it's, un, it's undisputed. But the DNL metric uses all the days of the year. We've talked about this before. And therefore, will take a situation like 4L and 4R, which are in use 121 days, about a third of the year, let's, let's use that, and will take the noise effect that those planes in use uh, create, but add 0, 0, 0, 0 for other day, all the other days of the year when they're not in use, and put that into a so-called average annual day. So uh, you, you know that to begin with that that therefore will dilute significantly the, the noise impact, and it does. And uh, to follow up on that, what I did was to uh, ask the FAA for access to their AED, AEDT noise model so that it could understand uh, uh, how they were uh, calculating that average annual day in use and the number of uh, planes that would uh, be in the baseline year on uh, 4L uh, as, as, as the, I'll call it the components from which they then derive their DNL metric. And for example, over uh, Milton Hill, and I also asked for over that triangle uh, between St. Elizabeth's and 
uh, Beth Israel and uh, Milton Academy. Uh, let's take the first. When you take 4L and 4R together and you look at the uh, noise effect that they're trying to track over Milton Hill, they will say that, well, uh, there, there are um, a over 150 planes that are there on the average annual day. So stop there. That means a third of the year, right? So you would multiply that and you'd say, yes, that's actually consistent with the experience of people on Milton Hill that on the days of use, it can be up to over 450 planes. Why? Because there'll be a planes at 180 miles an hour. That's three miles a minute. That, that's a, 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 essentially when you're looking out, that's, that's, you'll be seeing planes come over you uh, repeatedly. And that 151 uh, is uh, actually only uh, a fraction of the total uh, given that they then add a zero to each day when not in use and coming up with their metric of DNL based on that. Mm -hmm. Now, MIT, and I'll only take a second, M MIT itself said, for purposes of RNAV analysis, purposes of RNAV noise analysis, the, a, a better metric is to look at the so-called number of flights above a certain decibel level, 25 or or, 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 I'm sorry, 25 flights or 50 flights above a certain decibel level. And that decibel level will be 60 decibels by day and 50 decibels by night. And if you apply that to in use uh, uh, flight patterns, then you find that uh, there are, you know, on the case of Again, say, say Milton Hill, 4L4R, that's where you get the 450 flights on a day, on a, on a, on a, on a in-use basis, 150 on a, a yearly average basis, but uh, on a yearly average basis, 100, 150 flights, if you include all those days when uh, there are flights not happening, and even then, the average comes out to 150 flights at 60 decibels by day and 50 decibels by night. And so the actual impact is substantially uh, larger than that. Let me, let me keep going and I'll go, I'll try to speed up. They don't, as I've said before, include any noise uh, contour analysis, which would increase that effect. They did no field work. That AEDT model is the only thing they used. Um, I've talked about the fact that the DNL dilutes. They don't use the supplemental metric that I've just referred to. They don't use what the Department of Transportation Highway Department and the MIT study say is a, a perfectly appropriate supplemental metric. And the draft points out itself that the uh, FAA zone analysis indicates that they are able to and, and can use supplemental metrics when appropriate and this we submit is entirely the, the, the exact case where it is appropriate and it's arbitrary not to do so. Um, I'm almost done with this section. No wake turbulence analyses. Remarkably, the, as we know, when you're in a, say a small boat and a, big, a bigger boat or a ship comes right in front of you, that wake will uh, rock your, your little boat and yourself quite a bit. Well, in the air, the uh, airplanes have a, wa a, a wake uh, in the air and create waves behind them. And uh, in connection with this EA, on the one hand, the FAA has a section on wake turbulence analyses and uh, it shows a diagram of how that can uh, 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 occur. But what they don't do is then take 4R and 4L together and to uh, address the, what the wake turbulence analysis would mean for the, for the for, for these runways and for 4L. In their other uh, publications, the FAA points out that what they're trying to do with the RNAV path, and here the 4L RNAV path, is to optimize the spacing laterally and, uh, and horizontally between planes such that they can increase the number of planes Pa uh, passing through the throughput uh, per hour. And 
the wake turbulence optimization allows the planes to be cl more closely spaced. So that three miles that I mentioned separation might be down to two and a half miles, or in any event, the coordination of the planes on the two runway paths will be coordinated such if the new path is a RNAV path, uh, that they can optimize the wake turbulence. On average, wake turbulent analysis uh, optimization as published by the FAA, which is cited in the draft, uh, increases th throughput 7%. And at Memphis, it increased at 15%. But if that's the case, that means that not 255 planes, uh, and we don't even know whether they're going to be uh, using it on visual paths or advisory uh, um, basis. But in any event, uh, optimization of wake turbulence by uh, means of the introduction of the RNAV uh, will have some uh, potentially significant impact on the number of planes. And they don't, they don't um, address that. They don't explain that, even though they do raise the uh, benefits of wake turbulence analysis. It, nowhere do they connect it to noise impact. And then significantly, they have no um, discussion whatsoever of landing gear noise impacts. The uh, landing gear when deployed, and the studies both in Europe and the US are cited in this uh, draft comments, uh, comprise 40% uh, of the total noise impact when deployed. So knowing that, having seen the studies, uh, which again uh, were referenced in one of the MIT studies, I then sent a Freedom of Information Act request in the summer saying, look, if, if you're going to go ahead, which we don't want to go ahead, want you to go ahead, uh, I want to know uh, what your AEDT data shows with regard to, or any other data you have with regard to the deployment of landing gear. When for each aircraft, at what speed, uh, at what location, uh, relative to the, the, uh, you know, the touchdown uh, with respect to 4R in the baseline year? Answer? We have no data. There is no data on that. So then looking again uh, at the AEDT model, I then uh, asked them for access to that to see to what extent in the AEDT model there was any reflected assumption. And there isn't one. Uh, so uh, the, the fact of the matter is the effect of landing gear is nowhere reflected in the the environmental assessment uh, in terms of its determination that there's no significant impact, uh, and even with respect to uh, reflecting it uh, within a DNL metric, any metric you choose, preferably, preferably you'd also use supplemental metrics, preferably you would uh, have a, a uh, approach study area, not a general study area, but in, in no way is landing gear reflected. And, so, and then lastly, there's, this, there's an entire section on the important aspects of what I call non-transparency here. Incomplete statements, selective disclosure. As I've mentioned, the purpose and the need for the proposed action need to be uh, uh, clarified because the safety need is, 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 is asserted, but it seems to be uh, contradicted by the actual examples and needs to be further articulated so people, people can understand that those planes were in visual conditions, they were in visual contact, uh, they, that they're, they're, they themselves, the FAA, are dropping that, that, that uh, procedure, that circular procedure. So why is this a need with regard to the scope? Uh, there's really no articulation of this differentiation and why it is they're using an undifferentiated uh, general study area for one purpose, which is, you know, air traffic coordination, that's fine, but then also using it for an approach, which is, you know, not uh, 1,173 square miles, not a million people, uh, not, not 470,000 uh, procedures. The methodology I've talked about, uh, again, there's failure to disclose there are no flight track charts, no table, as I've mentioned, no statement, is this IMC only? Is no statement, is this 255 only? If not, what is it? What, no, no sort of differentiation of cleared or advisory use uh, in, during visual conditions or uh, in climate conditions. 
nothing about landing gear or the absence thereof, and no response to the technical questions which overlap uh, a lot of those uh, areas that I, that I mentioned. So I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. I hope I haven't gone on too long. And I, I would ask people to uh, you know, read the draft comments in their entirety. It's hard to read the draft EA in its entirety. It takes a long time, but I, I would encourage you to do as much as that as you can as well. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Doherty. Um, I, I think that I'll I speak on behalf of the board that we, we appreciate uh, your summary and um, as, as well as all, all the work that everyone's put into this. Um, I would ask the members if, um, if you have any questions or comments for, um, for Mr. Doherty or um, before we, we have our discussion. And actually you and Arthur, we, we, we could also ask Katie and Mike questions too since they, since they worked on this. Um, no. Yes, Madam Chair, I noticed we have a resident with a hand up and I don't know if that resident came in late, um, if that's possible. Oh. Um, I don't know okay. if you want to take any additional comment or question. Right. There um, are, I see a couple of other names that I don't think were there at the beginning, so people may have joined late. Right, they were here before we went to our um, our part of the meeting and I had, I had waited for a little while. Um, but I, uh, since they haven't spoken before, I'm, I'm certainly happy to, uh, take their comment. If you would please, um, state your, your name, uh, or names, if it's both of you and, um, your address and make your statement, please. Mr. and Mrs. McGonagall, sorry, or I shouldn't say that. I'm not sure that that's who it is. Owen and Kathy McGonagall, my apologies. Sorry, sorry, I had to unmute. It's um, just Kathy McGonagall. I live at 27 Center Street in Milton. Actually, my legal name is Catherine Sheedy McGonagall, sorry. Um, I just want to say, I. I to Mr. Doherty, I, this is a tremendous amount of work. Um, I read through the entire um, letter. I thought it was terrific. I did attend one of the FAA meetings and that was the first time I thought it was a total dog and pony show. I was incredibly disappointed. Um, it, it was upsetting, honestly. But I, it was the first time I heard the mention of the word safety. And I'm an attorney. I did take an ad law class in law school. It was exceptionally painful. And I understand like when you're writing this letter, reading through it, you know, you were very careful with your language. But when they when they brought in that whole safety argument, I was very concerned by this because if my memory serves me right, I, I don't know, I'm asking a question. Is this beyond just an arbitrary and capricious standard? Are they now um, able to implement this 4L because it's a higher level of scrutiny. I'm, maybe I'm not using the, the, the right jargon, but do you know what I'm saying? Like I'm concerned that um, the arbitrary capricious standard is not the standard they're gonna use. Well, I think that the FBA would uh, also a court. Uh, well, the, uh, you know what I'm is, saying, or am I not? I'm not articulating it well. I know because I don't know what I'm talking about. No, no, I hear you. I hear you. There's two different. So, with regard to the exercise of discretion to uh, assert that this is uh, necessary for safety reasons, the standard would be an arbitrary, capricious standard. Uh, that is, just, and, and we could go through that but it's not going to be a higher standard than that. Okay. Uh, and on the other hand, and as, as, as you read, uh, with regard to the disclosures, uh, that's a different standard. It's a standard that Justice Marshall, for example, articulated, uh, you know, uh, long ago and has been followed. That is to say, there's, if there's a material omission or misstatement, you know, the judge, is not going to defer to the 
discretion of the provider of the information because it's an objective standard and it's going to the judge is going to he or she is going to say okay what is the uh, what is a, a reasonable recipient of this uh, uh, information going to uh, understand and does the stated information contain information that is important and 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 reasonably significant for a full understanding without omission or misstatement. And that's an objective standard that the court will look to without, without deferring to the FAA's asserted um, belief that they believe that it's uh, reasonable as to what they've said or not said. That the court will, will look at that. And it's, so it's the difference between the, the former and the latter with regard to the uh, exercise of discretion in, in, in determining under their own uh, models and, and methods whether or not this is needed for safety, the, the, the court's appropriately going to say, well, okay, but let's, let's see whether or not there is a rational relationship what, or, or is this right. arbitrary and capricious? Because it, like they admitted, they haven't even been to Milton. They they conduct they collected no soil samples. They have collected no actual noise models. They've done nothing. Everything's use of algorithms, and it's basically conjecture, like scientific conjecture. But I wouldn't even argue that it's scientific. But what do you hope to accomplish by this letter? Because I feel like it's a done deal after attending that FAA meeting. Like, what do you? hope to accomplish with this? Like, will there be several, not, several, no, yeah. so, so, several things, several things. Let me, let me start with that, with the, with the, just as you mentioned at the, the workshop, yes. uh, just in terms of presentation alone, there is, um, and I use the, the, the uh, comparison in, in, in the draft. Uh, once upon a time when uh, companies were uh, raising capital in the public marketplace, uh, they would have what are called and still have what are called roadshows, which are oral supplements, in this case, a Zoom supplement to their written assessment, right? Their written offering. Right. Right. Well, those roadshows are regulated by the SEC and they are pre-cleared by the SEC and the Securities Exchange Commission. And that's the watchdog there. Here, the, here the citizens themselves need to be that watchdog because there is no uh, independent watchdog looking over the disclosures of the FAA. So starting there... My, my, I've said it right in that draft. I think that the uh, workshops are sort of a equivalent to a pre-regulated roadshow where they aren't complete, they're formulaic, and they and they don't an they they themselves didn't answer the questions asked with regard, for example, to the technical questions and others, but also aren't providing the kind of information such as, you know, <laughs> is this uh, inter is this um, uh, med meteorologic conditions only, you know, bad weather only? Uh, right. Is it, you know, 255 only? Is it all of those uh, uh, missing uh, for completeness purposes uh, uh, issues? So what, are I, what do we hope to accomplish here? As it says right at the beginning, this should be rescinded and uh, start over, go to a, a full environmental uh, uh, impact statement and, and take the time and use the methodology and, 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 and transparency of, of effort that, that is requisite rather than, than, rather than this. Right, but they're not gonna do that. So do you envision, like I have absolutely no hope, like despite all your wonderful work, do you envision an, an administrative law hearing? Like is that, would that be when they deny this request, which I'm sure I, I, they will. I, 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 think it, I think it would be premature to state publicly. All right. What I would Fair do, yeah. <laughs> and I and I don't and I don't. It's not my decision anyway. But I but I think it would be premature to. All right. Fair but, enough. But but the, but what we're trying to do is 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 create a basis uh, for action by the SEC by the FAA, FAA uh, and 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 then uh, make determinations based on whether that happens or not. Right. Do you think we should be collecting any of our own data, like our own um, soil samples, our own um, noise monitoring, like um, have our own independent investigator? Uh, 
I guess I would leave that to the select board. That's that would be quite a resource commitment. Uh, you know, even, even uh, cities like um, you know Medford and 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 others uh, is uh, Somerville. You know, with much more much more heavily populated cities. Uh, I'm not sh sure I've seen that. And I, just, I think there should be a collaborative approach. Like that's what I feel like is lacking. Like it, it's not going to magically like oh just shift. I I do think that we should be working with other towns. And I know that is a, a tough reach, but I really do think that in a fairness level, this is, it's not gonna be solved unless it's a regional approach. Like it can't just be Milton's problem. Oh, yes. The Congressman Lynch uh, leads the uh, Fierce Guys Caucus and, and has done a good job. There have been uh, revised statutes presented and I, I worked on one with uh, Senators Markey and uh, Warren in 2018. Went through it went through the House, but it at the yeah, Senate right. level, the Senate uh, Republican Chair uh, would not push it forward. So, depending upon future uh, political situation, that 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 multi airport, multi community. Uh, revision of the statute itself is uh, is, is a significant priority, okay. it, it, depending upon you know political outcomes. Right. Thank you. Melinda, you're muted. Was that? Melinda, you're still muted. Excellent, thank you. Sorry about that, um, uh, Ms. McGonagall. I'm sorry. I've been trying to, to tell you that your your three minutes are up, and I think we've gotten a bit off um, topic as 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 well. Um, but Mr. Zorf, I also wanted to recognize you. Yeah, I just wanted to say a couple of things um, uh, to jump off a couple of things that um, uh, that Kathy said. One is, um, you know, we, we began before COVID. Uh, the process of more data collection with the environmental monitor that we purchased. Now we only purchased one that was ten thousand dollars, and you know the hope is that we, and, the, and the need is to purchase more of those in order to collect enough data. Um, and with respect to the reg the regional approach on this project uh, for this uh, proposed for LR NEV, the affected communities are Dorchester and Mattapan and the part of Milton, and and we have reached out and gotten support from the Boston City Councilor who, um, whose district includes Mattapan and Dorchester. And we're hopeful to have another one and I think we will have another one uh, sign on as well. Uh, and we have the, certainly the, the, the state Senator and the state representative who cover the, the larger district. So we're, we're trying um, to get an regional approach and, and, and you're, I think you're absolutely right that that's really important for us to, uh, to do going forward. Thank you. Um, are there any other comments um, from the board? Uh, any statements you'd like to make about the, uh, or additional statements you'd like to make about the uh, the letter? I'll, Madam Chair, I'll just reiterate um, the thanks to Mr. Doherty and to others who worked on the letter and also to our state and federal elected officials and uh, colleagues in the city of Boston who have signed on to the letter, uh, as you know, as Mike Zula said. So um, I think it's consistent with what our arguments have been previously. There, there were some comments made at Citizens Speak about moving 4R traffic onto 4L, which has never been the town's position. Um, communities like Quincy and Braintree used to have more air traffic over them. And unfortunately that traffic has been moved over Milton. So the dispersion over other communities and making this, uh, you know, the, the airport is a community is a benefit to the region and the entire region needs to share in the burden of the airport, not just our community and other communities that are affected by other runway paths. So this is a unique situation with closely spaced parallel runways. We have a swath of our town that's between the two paths and impacted by both of them. And I think um, we're doing, you know, we're handling 4R in one way. We've had the MIT study propose some additional paths that can be explored for that. 
and the comments on the 4LEA, I think, um, raise a lot of good points. And I want to reiterate, reiterate again, thanks to Tom and all who, including Karis North and Andy Schmidt, everyone who worked on the letter um, and the residents who have either contact us, contacted us by email or by phone to uh, share their thoughts on it. So thank you to everyone. Thank you. Well, if there's um, no further discussion, and, um, and I think that uh, um, Ms. Conlon um, and, and Mr. Zul have expressed uh, the, the gratitude of, uh, uh, of the board, but I'll say that definitely my, my gratitude um, to our, our state and federal elected officials for all they have done so far and, um, and that continued, uh, continued cooperation. Um, so our, at that at this point, I will propose um, um, a motion. I, I will also say that this is on our agenda tomorrow, since um, Mr. Wells can't be with us today. Um, we could either revote or he could say that he is in support of the letter so that he could also sign it because um, I, I think that it would be good for us to actually, you know, all sign the letter. Um, rather than using electronic signatures or, or leaving one of us out. Mr. Doyle? Oh, you're muted, Mr. Doyle. There we go, it took a moment. I apologize for that. Um, I just had a couple of uh, observations or comments, if I may, Madam Chair. Um, I would like to um, add um, my agreement with what you, you said to the work that's been done by so many people for so long and well before the time that I um, had the privilege of joining the select board. I would suggest, I do not know who all the copy recipients of this will be. Uh, but I would suggest, um, as he was referenced in conversation, that uh, Senator Markey uh, certainly be included uh, since he sits on the uh, subcommittee on transportation and safety of the Senate committee that has oversight for the Federal Aviation Administration. Um, on page 53, I believe, yes, page 53, I would like to suggest that um, no numbers appear for the year 2020, really that a statement um, indicating uh, the impact of COVID-19 be entered or 2020 be eliminated altogether. I, I don't think it's uh, useful to have any numeracy there whatsoever. But again, that's just my opinion. Um, I would um, hope that any of the comments um, that will uh, support or reinforce the document received uh, tonight um, orally or beforehand in writing um, be evaluated for that purpose. And um, I just wanted to ask um, where it stated um, a number of times about uh, the words being used um, capriciously, um, arbitrarily, et cetera. If, if, this is a, if, if this is something that we believe is um, purposeful on the part of the FAA, that uh, would be my observation that we should say so. Uh, that if this is um, a total force, uh, we should be very explicit about that. I concur with uh, uh, Kathy McGonigal's observations about the FAA presentation. And um, those are my comments, Madam Chair. Um. Mr. Doyle, if I could clarify, so you were talking about the first draft, um, page 53, is that correct? Um, I've had, I have several of them. Um, uh, so the, the one dated the 10th of November? 
Well, I have November 18, 2020 at the heading of the one that I'm referring to. Okay. But I think I saw it earlier too. So if we if we do have data for 2020, I would suggest that that not be included. But that's uh, just my opinion. This is this is with reference uh, to the enumeration over time of the noise complaints. Right, the complaint data. So um, I'm just trying to understand. Uh, my understanding is to illustrate um, the effect of the pandemic and also that um, this really isn't the time. I, I mean, to, to me, I thought it, it lended, um, it illustrated that this was not a, a, an illustrative time of um, actual air traffic and therefore it renders the EA process um, you know, not credible. So I, I may be misunderstanding uh, the, the um, why that was included, but. I'm just turning to, I agree with you that the, the point is that we're in a lull and you can look, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think I think without that, our, the point um, is a bit more difficult to see. But I think right above that, Arthur, too. Um, I'm, I'm looking at the November 12th version. It, it does mention the pandemic significantly right. curly, curtailed air traffic globally, so that might give more context to it. No, it does I say it's hard, but I just think the presence of the number. Um, speak more loudly than the sentence. Okay, I guess it would be helpful to, to me if we could get the exact sentence. So we're talking about, for example, the carryover sentence since the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic at the bottom of page uh, 52? It's the sentence um, from the, the paragraph that begins specifically in Milton and then mm -hmm. continues on as uh, Katie said, when the pandemic significantly curtailed air traffic globally. Then you have the table with the heading total number of noise complaints filed by year in Milton. At the bottom, it starts with 2012 and at the top with 2020. You have a drop from 2019 of 41,000 plus to 2020, showing 1,634. And I, I think that works against the message you want to convey and what you want the readers to understand. But again, it's just uh, my opinion, but in working with data for years and years, um, you either want to uh, eliminate um, that type of uh, disparity or difference, or be very careful that all audiences understand what it means very explicitly. Yeah, I've got it now. So. I mean, for example, what maybe we can do is track down that the 1634 are pre-COVID. Are pre in other words, in the first, in the first, uh, in other words, the planes were flying in January and February. They went, they stopped flying by April. And so it, it could be, it could, we, we could, we could try to uh, address the time or just drop it. I'll, I'll leave it to you to decide. I just want to make the observation for consideration. Yeah, it's great. Thanks for, thanks for that. You're welcome. I think section 10B was the one that still needed to be either filled in or um, or the placeholder taken out just regarding residents' comments. So um, right. I, I think if we wanted to vote this tonight, we could approve it in substantially the form that it's in, and then we could um, just, just ask that that be finalized prior to submitting it tomorrow. Uh, yeah, and if um, we I'm sorry, prior to 
prior to submitting it to the FAA. I think that's just a matter of either adding letters that we've received or just taking out a placeholder. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And similarly, with regard to the 2020, if I can narrow that down to the, the, the pre-COVID months, I'll do it. If it's too confusing, I'll just take out 2020. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, Right, I'm, I, I, I think your suggestion also, um, Katie, is, is a good one, um, uh, that we can improve it subject to, um, to, to the, um, the, the proposed, the, the, the choices between the two changes in section 10A um, and then, um, to either the completion or the um, uh, taking out the uh, that uh, the the resident comment um, portion uh, prior to submission. And Madam Chair, this has already been signed. Um, we already have signature pages from some of the elected officials, so um, I think that those are minor changes that really are not substantive. So I'll move that we approve and sign the draft comment, uh, well, not the draft, I move that we approve and sign the comment letter on the draft environmental assessment for runway 4L in substantially the form presented tonight with the uh, issues that we discussed to be finalized. Second. Can I have a second? Thank you. Uh, all those in favor, uh, Ms. Gomlin? Yes. Mr. Doyle? You're muted, Mr. Doyle. I keep doing that to you, Madam Chair. Am I your fault? No. Yes. Thank you. Mr. Zula? Yes. Thank you. Ms. Collins, yes. And, um, motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Thank you. Thank you. All those in favor, Ms. Collins? Yes. Mr. Doyle? Yes. Mr. Zula? Yes. Collins, yeah. Um, th thank you everyone um, who, who attended and watched uh, uh, on television and uh, and also uh, Hillary and our meeting host. I don't know who it was today, Mr. Doherty for uh, attending and Mr. Denny as well. Uh, thank you to the members. <laughs>